Hello. Today I'll sp be speaking about ZODB, the graph database for Python developers. So you may have seen some websites that look like this. Beautiful front end, not so cute back end. What we want to do is make the graph back end much more graceful. And these graph databases, they're, they've gotten quite hot in the market. Um, so these are some of the five leading companies. <coughs> Neo4j, OrientDB, OrangoDB, NextLogic, and AllegroGraph. Let's take a look at some details about these products. Most of them are in Java. Um, MarkLogic, they're the heavyweight. They got $173 million in funding used by most of the banks. Neo4j got $80 million. It's, this is a hot market. But these are mostly applications written in Java. And the problem with Java is it's statically bound. You just don't have the power and flexibility. And in particular, what they do is they publish a particular type of model that they support. And uh, you know something like Neo4j or Allegro Graph, they just have one type of model they support. Some of the others have several types of models that they support. But you come to something like ZODB written in Python, it'll support any model you want. It's persistent Python. Any Python data structures you want to represent, it'll store it. So much more powerful, much more flexible. I, I'm just amazed that all these Python developers are busy using statically bound Java databases. It's just not as flexible as a dynamically bound Python database. Okay, so why would you want to use a graph database in the first place? Well, the big, uh, the classic application is an org chart. So that's a tree. That's a type of graph. Um, maps very nicely onto a graph database. If you're doing any kind of network application, those are those are always networks. Again, they map very nicely onto graph databases. Uh, if you take a look at Python's um, natural language toolkit, the, it generates trees, parse trees, that's for a single sentence. You do a whole paragraph interconnected, you get a graph. Uh, beautiful soup, parse tree, also a tree. Uh, let me talk a bit more about my application. I'm doing these maps. And so uh, really quite a complex data structure. It's quite easy to implement on top of um, the ZODB. So at the top level, I have a world. Um, underneath that, we have a region called Europe. Underneath that, we have a country called Poland. Each of these are different classes. Underneath that, we have a city called Katowice. Underneath that, we have a city called a company called Bloggery, and then all kinds of content items underneath that. So people don't want to see the data structures. Uh, it's much more useful to actually show what the interfaces look like. So, so let's take a quick look through here. Here's the top level. You can go into different branches. In particular, there's a whole branch of Python companies maps, but also of open source um, projects maps. So let's click into, we'll skip the world, we'll click right into Europe, click into Poland, click into Warsaw, click, uh, look at one of the cities in Warsaw, and we'll click into that city. And here you see there's lots of links about the company to various places. It's really too many. And a basic principle in human factors is there shouldn't be more than seven items in a category. So if you're building any kind of categories, hierarchies are great. Organizations are hierarchies because people can't manage too many connections. Um, it just it works great. And of course, the wonderful thing about the ZODB is it's so easy to use. Um, here we have a simple leaf object. We initialize it, set the title to title. You can have a render method. And basically, to make it persistent, we just have to subclass off class persistent. So they're class persistent objects and they're class persistent um, containers. So containers like a dictionary, but it's stored as a B tree on the file system. So very, very powerful tools. And of course, you want to you have a root object at the root of the tree, and you want to add either an individual object. So you can say root dot leaf equals create a new leaf called single leaf. Or usually you have a whole bunch of these things. So you'll do root of leaf one and create a new leaf called green leaf. Root of leaf two, create a new leaf called called red leaf. So it's very easy to create large collections of of leaves on a tree, create whole trees. And of course, you have to actually go ahead and create a database. So there are multiple differences you can do in relational storage, or Zio server storage, or file storage. File storage is the easiest. This mem storage, a couple others. Um, and so you import the right libraries. You say, hey, let's go create me a database called data.fs. Give me a connection to it, and give me the root objects. And then you can start operating on the root objects, adding stuff, having transactions. So this is way better than the traditional approach, because usually you have a relational database and you have some object relational mapping, and then you have some objects in memory. And so <laughs> the great thing about just using the ZODB is you don't get any database schema, you don't get any object relational mapping, um, you don't have referential integrity problems. 
you don't have a problem with, you do have automatic garbage collection that simplifies life, and you don't have to worry about any manual reads or writes, so it's just much, much simpler. And of course, it's really magical. It gives you this illusion that your objects are persistent. You just reach into the database, you pull out the root object, you attach things to it, you commit your transaction, you detach things, you commit your transaction, it all just, it's, it's just really beautiful. And it's just Python. So in order to, um, p you know, there's no SQL select in here. It's just Python. Say to update the leaf, you get the root object, you find the leaf object, and you set its title to be yellow leaf. You do a transaction.commit. Uh, if you want to do a very simple, stupid query, you can iterate over all the items in the root and print the key and the title. So you can just, just do trans Python um, functions on, on these objects. And it's a proper ACID database. It's optimistic concurrency control. It's actually a version database, which we'll get to in a few minutes. So you, you have a tree of objects. Even when you have a graph of objects, you access them as a tree, and you can actually traverse across the graph if you want to. And so typically, uh, the root will be slash, and then if you go to, um, say we want to get to the object on the lower right-hand corner. So you do slash slash software, it takes you off to the one, one layer down, slash software slash Libraries takes you all one to the one on the right, two layers down. Slash software slash library slash database libraries takes you all the way down to the right corner. So you just traverse to your objects. And of course, you can also do, I also do canonical URLs. So um, if you're moving your objects around, then the URLs will change. And so what you do is you do canonical URLs where every ob there's a unique name for every object, and every name only has one object. And then you can do an index from the root that takes you down to whichever object you want. So this is actually already, we're doing a graph database. You don't even see it. I didn't even realize it was a graph database um, for quite a while after I did this. And so what does this mean? So if you delete an object on the leaves, you have to delete it in two places. You have to delete it from its parent, but you also have to delete it from this categorical index. Um, if you rename an object, you have to rename it in two places. If you delete a branch, you have to delete not only the branch from the parent, but you also have to delete all of the children from the canonical index. Not that hard to do. Anyhow. Okay, so we find an object, and then we execute views on this object. And we'll get to a bunch of views in a moment. And of course, we may have different views on different nodes of the tree. So the, the views are actually, um, the most important ones are the CRUD views. So when you get the ZODB demo, you get some four, it must be seven, it must be seven CRUD views. Maybe it's eight CRUD views. Um, and so for example, you can't do anything on any leaf. So if you've got a leaf object, you can't add stuff to it. That's a leaf, okay? And if you've got a root object, you can't delete it. And later on, when you're building more sophisticated applications, you may want to be able to add certain content types to certain branches and not others. So, so there's a whole tool set for doing all of this. But, but let's just start off with the CRUD, because that's the one that everybody knows, right? So the basic cr CRUD, create, read, update, delete. Um, delete's really simple. We're not going to pay much attention to that. Create, read, and update, they all take some meta information. So what the ZODB does, what the ZODB demo does is it uses Zope.interface. And so Zope.interface has a, a lot of wonderful properties, but part of what it does, it tells you about your attributes. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, a subclass of, of interface. Um, there's iLeaf and then iTreeLeaf. We'll get in a minute to what iLeaf does. And um, we basically are uh, defining two variables. One is title and the other is body. And the first one's a text line, the other is a text area. And they both have a title and they're both required. And so then on the right-hand side, what we do is in order to tell the software about the attributes of this particular uh, tree leaf object, we just say at implements tree leaf. Once you do that, sort of all this crud happens for you magically. Um, Okay, so delete is, is easy, but what happens in graph databases, and particularly in the ZDB, is you get this whole nother range of CRUD. It's what I call ZODB extended CRUD. So you can rename your objects, you can cut and paste them, you can copy and paste them, and you can do history and restore on them. So this is not part of relational databases. This is graph databases, and in particular, it's um, version graph databases. And so the question is, which of these CRUD methods can we do on which objects? And remember we did, here's the leaf class. And again, we have the implementer, uh, we set the at implementer decorator 
saying that saying that basically it implements uh, iLeaf. And once you do that, um, well, let's take a look at what iLeaf does. And so imagine a tree, you've got basically three different types of things. You've got leaves, you've got containers, and you've got the root container. And they all behave differently. Um, and the more complex applications are going to have even more variety. But, but this is the basic place to start. So let's take all of them can be displayed. They can all be edited. Um, just check something. Yeah, all that can be displayed, they can all be edited. And, um, but the root object, well, you don't want to be deleting a root object. That kind of doesn't make any sense. You don't want to rename it, and you don't want to move it, and you don't want to copy it. So, so the root container does not get those, does not inherit those interfaces. Okay. And then the leaf object, well, that's not a B tree container, so you can't do certain B tree, well, this is a managed view on B trees, we'll show you in a minute. And you can't add stuff to leaf, so they don't get those operations. And then the other, they don't get those interfaces. And of course, the root object is, that's the, usually your, your URL comes in, it goes to the root URL. And so that is what's called iPublication root. And that has various properties for traversal. You start there, and it has properties for uh, calculating URLs. So that's all very important. So these are, then you get a pla pass. Because remember, we're just showing you three different classes. And so when... Um, when we looked at the leaf class, we saw it had at implementer leaf, and so now you know what, what's in that i leaf that's implemented. Okay, so that's all a nice theory, but let's actually go and see what, what, how does all this stuff work. So let's go take it to have an interface, and here is, uh, here's the ZODB CRUD demo you can download. It is, it's just a great way to get started on applications. So um, you've got, you can add a tree branch. Um, this is Basically, you can add a tree branch, you can add a tree leaf. We'll just do a quick, quick, actually, wait a sec. What we want to do here is we want to go into, we have tree leaves and tree branches. So we're going to go one level down, and we're going to add a tree branch. Uh, this will be third level. Third level. This is what goes in the URL. And then, um, sorry, third level is what goes in the URL. And then what the human sees is third level. And we can say, what a lovely branch. And there are all kinds of different types with zope.schema. There are all kinds of different types you can use in the CRUD definition of the um, attributes. OK, so let's go ahead and add that. And you can see we're here. we've got the breadcrumbs. Zope CRUD demo, um, the brown branch, and the third level branch. Oops. Yeah, no, I spelled that correctly. We can add more tree branches. We don't do that. We're just um, and notice here we can delete, display, edit. There's a management view. We can add stuff. But let's go add a tree leaf, and you'll see obviously um, a nice leaf, a nice leaf, a nice leaf, lovely leaf. We'll add this. And in the tree, you can see where we are. We're at the um, ZDB CRUD demo brown branch, third level, and a nice leaf. And of course, because the leaf doesn't have i addable, you can't add any stuff to any stuff to it. Um, okay, so let's go back up to the top. So we've got to, we did um, adding crud, create. The next thing is you can um, view it. You can edit it. You can del uh, delete it. You get a confirmation before you do delete it. And we can go back up to root. Um, OK, so, so we've got CRUD. We've got CRUD on objects. The basic, that's the basic database CRUD. But we also have this whole extended uh, ZODB graph tree database CRUD. So we can take objects, and we can cut them. And we can go into a tree, uh, into a lower branch of the tree, and we can paste them. And we can take objects. And you can see we're one level down. We can take a look at the breadroom so we can see where we are. Uh, we can take objects, and we can copy them, and we can paste them. And suddenly we've got lots of copies of everything. So cut, copy, paste. And of course, we can rename stuff as the other one. Rename blue, pink. Have you ever seen a pink leaf? Rename. We can do rename multiple items at the same time. So, okay, that's the next level of, of CRUD, and I haven't released this yet, but I'm going to show you, um, 
I'm going to show you history crud. So here's on the next one. Um, the ZODB demo is for file system developers. I'm also building on top of that a Zopache integrated development environment. And that's going to give you JavaScript objects and CSS objects and Python script objects and, and HTML objects. And so this is actually uh, the root. And actually, um, I hired a marketing guy. And so he's been creating publicity text for my root. So let's see what he's created. Let's take a look. Eh, sorry, that's not what he created. Uh, manage. Manage. Crud. History. Oh, maybe actually the demo is better this way. What he did is he created this one. And let's take a look at a few. Ah, okay, that's right. Let's see, what did he write? He did Zopachi is fantastic, best development tools in the world. Everyone should use this. Aren't you embarrassed? No, no, no. Th this, is, this guy is not a good marketer. It's not subtle at all. I don't like what he wrote. What we're going to do is we're going to ditch this. We're going to go back to the history. And um, here we have history. And let's see, those are different versions. Version 3, this must be the versions he wrote. I think maybe this is the version. Yeah, this is the version I wrote. Uh, we just clicked on View. So we clicked on, sorry, we looked at, clicked on Source. We saw the version I wrote. So we're going to restore this. And then we're going to take a look at a view. OK, much more reasonable. So, so they have the whole history thing. And whenever you're doing text editing or HTML, it's just, or um, particularly when I'm doing web development with HTML through the web browser, it's just so nice to have this, to be able to go back to previous versions and grab, grab pieces that I may have removed. Very, very sweet. OK, um, so back to the presentation. I'll just slide back a slide. So remember, we have um, all the different CRUDs. We have, cr sorry, we had create, read, and update. We've got delete. So we've got the zope.interface and zope.schema, which allows you to define those. And then we have the extended CRUD for graph databases, rename, cut, paste, copy, paste, and the beautiful history restore, which you get from version database like the ZODB. Okay, on with this presentation. We did the two demos. And so, so you understand the basic ideas of the CRUD and how easy it is to, to, to create, um, create CRUD and then do the basic versions on these objects. And then you start off when you have the ZOD bem D be demo, you start off with the leaf object and a um, branch object. So it's really easy for you to customize and do whatever you want. And then you just take it from there. And so you get into production, and you start to have a lot of clients, and you need to have more than just a single server. And so here we have an image of Zio, which is where we have all the clients connecting through the cloud to the load balancer to the various Zio clients, and then those all connect to the database Zio server. So the, the database gets split among these. And what happens is you get a cache. So there are a whole bunch of, in your tree, there's a whole bunch of objects stored in the Z Zio server, and the Zio clients get a cache of those objects. And then as transactions happen, that cache is updated, and it uh, updates the server, and it invalidates the other caches, and they go grab the new ones if they want. So that, that's how the distributed objects work for um, serving websites. OK, so at this point, I break for questions. Uh, this is a video I'm creating for my office, so there's no one here to ask questions. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and answer questions. There's just sort of a standard list of questions that people have. So the first one is, um, how do you contact me? Pythonlinks.info. Um, or just, you know, if, I, if you're at one of my talks, come and talk to me after the meeting. Or go to Twitter, at, at Pythonlinks. Um, so Pyramid has something uh, called Substance D. And at first glance, it looks very similar like th than this. Um, a pyramid looks very similar to this. Maybe Pyramid has way more users, so, so why am I doing this? And there's a whole bunch of differences that between the Substance D approach and the Zopachi approach. So first of all, Substance D was done by a corporate consultant. His first and top priority is performance. He says so very clearly in the article Defense of uh, Pyramid. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've released lots of products. I'm releasing products faster and faster. And um, what I'm concerned about is development speed. So computers are really cheap compared to my cost and time. Um, and so I, yeah, I want a rich toolkit to help me be as productive as possible. And of course, he did it in 2005. If you know the history, uh, they had released Zope at that time. There was huge libraries. It was too complex. People weren't quite sure what to do. There was great confusion. 
Um, the guy in charge of Pyramid, he just kind of cut it all out. He stripped it all down. He said, we're just going to have sort of minimalist system and you can add what you want to. And that was, I think, the right strategy for 2005. But, you know, in 2018, people have been working on these libraries a long time. And they've polished up. Um, one guy I'm working with, Troll Foot, he's done such a brilliant job. He's just done a gorgeous job on these libraries. And so instead of just having a stripped down version where I have to grab whatever I want, I now have these very rich toolkits that just the productivity, the development speed is so much faster. Um, okay, the next thing is that in the corporate environment, you have a little bit of ZeoDB, but really it's mostly relational. And if you're putting up MVPs, then it's primarily ZeoDB, maybe eventually I'll tie into, into some relational database or some network tools, network databases. Um, as for object a access, uh, Substance D does dispatch or traversal. So Apache does traversal or canonical. So very different spaces. Content types. These are raging debates. Um, if you l read the history of the name Substance D, they're building content types through the web and the people, a lot of the file system developers just think it's a nutty idea and some of the web develops. So it's a very controversial issue. I'm not going to wade into that. Um, personally, I think uh, even if you just have a template of a file, you really want to create your classes on the, on the file system, but then it's okay to define your instance variables and meta information on through the web and because then it's really easy to move it down to the file system. But you have to actually have your class itself defined on the file system. And that has to do with s some details about how Python is structured. And then of course, the content types, they edit them in the browser, but the Zopachi ID, I'm sort of way out there and we'll be doing, we'll be supporting browser-based development of sort of a browser-based JavaScript integrate the development environment. But that's down the road. I'm not doing that yet. The, a lot of people don't want me to do it. Um, what else? And of course, what they did in Substance D is they hid all those beautiful Zopdot interface. And I'm, of course, using it heavily. This whole ZODB demo is leveraging the Zopdot interface, both in the um, in deciding which CRUD views any object will support, and also in the attributes. And finally, Substance D doesn't have any ad adapters. Uh, this uh, stuff that I'm doing has a lot of adapters, use them heavily, uh, very, very powerful stuff, particularly when you're, you're working with somebody else's code, the ability to configure it is just wonderful, very, very powerful. So uh, different philosophies, anyhow, everyone gets to choose. The next question people ask is, anybody actually using the ZODB? And the answer is yes, um, some in the pyramid community, but I think maybe the heavier use is in the Plone community. There are places like the Governor Brazil alone that has a hundred different websites, uh, President's Office, uh, um, parliament, city offices, a hundred different websites in, in Brazil, just Brazil, are using Plone. So it's really quite heavily used. It's a solid community behind the ZODB. The next question is, everyone asks, how does this compare to relational databases? So we have a sense of a tree or a graph, and everybody knows about tables and relational databases. So there's some things that are really easy to do in ZDB and very hard to do in relational databases. So in some of my websites, I have 10 different classes. Think of them as 10 different tables. And so if there are 10 different classes in a particular node of the tree, it's very easy to iterate all over them. You just do a for loop in Python. If you try to do that in a relational database structure, you have to actually do a join across 10 different tables. Um, Similar, when I write a transaction, all the transactions uh, involving 10 different classes, not that I ever do that many, um, they all get written to the same place in the, on the file system. Whereas in a relational database, you'd actually have to do 10 different disk accesses to different parts of the file system. So, so there's some things that are very different. On the other hand, what's really easy in a relational database is if you want to find all the leafs with a particular area, it's really easy to do that index. Whereas in the... Um, in the ZODB, you have to manually create those indexes. So how do we do that? Well, basically, uh, we need to create a catalog. So catalog equals catalog. Um, and then we need to get some, to find some functions for accessing the area. So here we have a get area method. Um, you pass it, you know, an object and a default value, and it returns the area. You then have to tell the catalog that we have an index. You're basically creating an index on the catalog called area, and you say this is the method to do, and then you have to create some leaves, 
and you have to index those leaves. And sometimes when those objects change, you re-index them. And at the final line seven, you can actually query for all the leaves within a certain area range, whose area is between 20 square centimeters and 40 square centimeters. So these catalogs, um, this I guess repose.catalog, uh, they're a bunch of different catalogs. They all basically do the same thing. Um, there's some external cataloging tools too. So anyhow, there's some things in easy in ZeoDB, some things are hard. It's, it all depends upon your application. Okay, the next question that everyone asks is about speed. So uh, Jim Fulton, the author, he says it'll do, uh, it's the new version, uh, it supports writes to multiple files at the same time. So it now does thousands of transactions per second. I, I wish I had that much traffic on my websites. Um, <coughs> So maybe if you have very simple transactions, relational databases are slightly faster, but if you're, as soon as you're doing complex transactions with CODB, particularly if you're trying to write to 10 different, um, if you have a transaction that involves 10 different tables, 10 different classes, the CODB will be much faster for writes. Scalability, um, they did hundreds of gigabytes at Zope Corporation, and if you need terabytes, then you can use its cousin, very, very similar technology, but it's spaces across multiple computers called Neo. So it'll scale, it's way beyond my dreams. Uh, lots of different databases, um, Python databases, other graph databases. Anyhow, I think the ZODB is a wonderful graph database for Python developers. I think the ZODB demo that I've now released as open source makes it really fast and easy to bring up prototype applications. I invite you to give it a try. If you have any questions, contact me. Thank you very much.